Okay, I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to the NCSA and start our Spring 2005 Colloquia series here. Today we have the first speaker of the series. I hope if you haven't seen our, our posters, uh, you uh, take a look at them and note down the other very distinguished speakers we have come in this semester. So for our first speaker, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sharon Hammer-Schiffer. Sharon is the Swanland Chair and Professor in the Department of Chem Chemistry here at the University. She's also a Fellow of the American Physical Society, the American Chemical Society, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the Biophysical Society. In addition, she's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the US National Academy of Sciences and the International Academy of Quantum Molecular Science. On top of all these many distinguished honours, she's one of a small number of faculty at the U of I who have been awarded the distinction of being a, a Blue Waters professor, which makes her particularly relevant for our interest here at NCSA. So Sharon's research centres around chemical and bi biological processes, where her work covers both the development of analytical theories, computational methods, and their application to a wide range of systems. So today, I'm looking forward to hearing more about uh, Sharon's work. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to speak here. It was at least an easy trip, right? I just had to walk down on Matthews. So um, it's my pleasure to be here to talk about some of the work that we've been doing on the supercomputers here and elsewhere uh, to simulate chemical and biological processes. So I'm going to start out with a few introductory slides, very basic slides, just to lay the foundation for the science that I'll talk about and also to motivate why we need to use such computationally expensive methods to look at these types of problems. So I'm interested in studying chemical and biological reactions. So the challenge here is that chemical bonds are breaking and forming, and this involves the rearrangement of electrons. So for example, if a hydrogen transfers from a donor to an acceptor, then we need to break this bond with the donor, and then we need to form this bond with the acceptor. And that involves electrons as well as nuclei. These reactions can occur either in the gas phase or in solution or proteins. We're really interested in the solution or protein side of things. And the environment can significantly impact the reaction. So that means that we have very large systems. Right? We're not just looking at a few atoms. We're looking at hundreds or hundreds of thousands of atoms. So this is our challenge. And just to set the stage, if we want to compare to experiment, so the whole purpose of running these simulations is we want to explain experimental data and make experimentally testable predictions, then we want to be able to calculate, for example, rates to con compare to experimental measurements. And so we need to calculate a free energy barrier, something like this, all right? And the, the rate is going to be faster for a lower free energy barrier. So if this poor person who's trying to roll this ball up the hill, it's going to be much easier, right, to roll the ball up a, sh a lower hill than a higher hill. And it's the same thing with, with atoms and molecules. And another way to view this is that the higher free energy corresponds to lower probability. So if we start out with 100 people rolling balls up the hill, only a small fraction will have the, you know, the fortitude to get to the top. All right? And the same thing happens in atoms and molecules. Only a fraction can get over the barrier. It's actually very low probability, a very rare event, to get to the top of the barrier and actually react successfully. So one way to go about this, you might say, well, the standard way is let's just do classical molecular dynamic simulations. And this is based on molecular mechanical force fields, where each atom is represented as a sphere, as a ball. And then each configuration of atoms has a potential energy assigned to it. So for example, if we have a protein or some system in solution, there's going to be bonding interactions. So you'll have these spheres connected by springs. There are going to be non-bonding interactions. You'll have steric interactions. Van der Waals, so these things are going to repel each other when they get too close. And you're also going to have electrostatic interactions. So each, each atom will have a partial charge associated with it. And if they're opposite charges, they'll repel each other. If they're the same charge, if, 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 if they're opposite charges, they'll attract each other. And if they're the same charge, then they will repel each other. So you have some potential energy function that includes all these kinds of interactions plus more. So lots of different interactions in there. And then if you want to do molecular dynamics, you'll say, OK, I want to solve Newton's equations of motion. So just F equals MA, right? Force equals mass times acceleration. We all did this probably in high school. And the forces are going to be obtained from that potential energy function I talked about on the previous slide. So if, if, if I told you that someone was going to throw a baseball 
right? We would all know we could solve Newton's equations of motion if you told us the initial velocity and position. We could all figure out how to find out where it was going to be and how fast it was going to be moving at any time. And we want to now do the same sort of thing for a big protein. So now instead of a single baseball, we have lots of these spheres interacting according to a very complicated interaction. Here we just had gravity. Here we have all of these potential energy interactions I talked about on the previous slide. So what's the problem? We've got lots of cycles on, on all of these supercomputers that are doing these classical molecular dynamics, right? Klaus Schulten's group alone right here is using many, many cycles. And you can learn a lot about biological and chemical systems by doing these kinds of classical molecular dynamic simulations. But the problem is you can't learn anything about reactions with the classical mechanical force field because it doesn't allow bonds to break and form. And I already told you the whole point of chemistry is you're breaking and forming bonds. All right? And this is an inherently quantum mechanical effect. So a chemical bond, you can see this. We have these two nuclei shown by these red circles. And then we have electrons smeared out in between them. And that's a chemical bond. All right? So we, we can't use classical mechanical force fields to describe this property. Instead, we would need to use electronic structure methods. So ab initio methods, say hartree fock theory or higher level or density functional theory, DFT is another way to do this. But if we're looking at these huge systems with hundreds of thousands of atoms, we can't really do this very effectively. So people, again, are using cycles on these supercomputers to do this, but they're looking at very small molecules, you know, a few atoms, maybe 10, 20 atoms, but we have hundreds of thousands of atoms. So this is obviously not going to, to work for us either. So what we do is we combine the best of both worlds. We say, all right, we're going to have to use a hybrid approach where we use quantum mechanics for the part where we have bonds breaking and forming, and then we use molecular mechanical force fields for the rest of the system. So if you have a protein like this, you can say, well, we've got a QM region. That's where the action is happening. Bonds are breaking and forming. All right, that's where we need to do electronic structure. You could do hartree fock DFT, or whatever, whatever you need to do. And the rest of it, though, will just be our standard molecular mechanical classical force fields. Why would we want to waste our time doing this high-level calculation on something where there's no bonds breaking and forming anyway? All right, so here we get the best of both worlds by using a kind of hybrid quantum classical method. So that's electronic quantum effects. But it, it gets a little more complicated because sometimes you also have nuclear quantum effects. So usually in these, these simulations, all of the nuclei are moving according to Newton's equations of motion, just F equals MA. But some of the nuclei, especially a hydrogen atom, will, will behave quantum mechanically. So that needs to be treated quantum mechanically as well. So if you look at this, uh, this movie here, a very simple movie, if you had a, a proton or a hydrogen moving in a classical potential here, this double well, imagine train tracks and you have a billiard ball and you let it go. All right, what's it going to do classically? It's just going to go back and forth and back and forth, right? And if you didn't give it enough energy from the beginning to get over this barrier, it will never get over. It'll just stay over here on this side and go back and forth and back and forth. But it turns out that in reality, we have uh, quantum mechanical effects. For example, we have zero point energy. It actually never gets to the bottom of the well. And we can have hydrogen tunneling, where even if it starts out with this energy that's lower than the barrier, it can, in fact, tunnel through the barrier and get to the other side, even if it doesn't have that energy to get over the barrier. So these are effects that we may need to include for reactions that involve hydrogen transfer. And that's actually a very simplified picture. It's clearly not what really happens. It's not a particle tunneling through, through the barrier. The hydrogen nucleus needs to be described as a wave function, very similarly to how we describe electrons as wave functions in electronic structure theory. So you can calculate the hydrogen wave function for this double well potential. And the wave function will tell us the probability of finding the hydrogen at each point in space. So what you see from here is you see we have equal probability of being in both of these wells. You even have some probability of being in the middle here, in the barrier region. That's very low probability, but it's not zero. And that's, of course, what tunneling is. It means you have a non-zero probability of getting from one side to the other. And this is going to be more and more important for light particles. Clearly, if we took a baseball and threw it at that wall over there, right, you, you, it's going to come back. It's not going to tunnel through the wall. We all know that from experience. But hydrogen atoms are lighter. And it turns out that hydrogen atoms, in fact, can tunnel it down. Th those mass and length scales, you have hydrogen tunneling, even in enzymes and in solar cells and all these different things that we actually use every day. Tunneling is happening 
for those hydrogen nuclei. So we may need to include those effects. For example, we may need to calculate the tunneling splitting, which will tell us the probability of tunneling through the barrier. And that will be more important for lighter atoms. And again, hydrogen is the one where it's really going to matter the most. So I've laid out a bunch of challenges here. Right? Classical simulations are not adequate. We need electronic quantum effects to break and form bonds. And we need nuclear quantum effects in some cases if we have a hydrogen transferring, which we often do. And we also need to include the solvent or protein environment, which means we have very large systems. And that's why we can't do quantum mechanical simulations of the whole system. That's what we would like to do, treat all electrons and all nuclei quantum mechanically and just go at it, right? But there's no supercomputer in the world that will let us do that for the kinds of systems that I'm talking about. And that's why we need these hybrid quantum classical methods that allow us to include electronic and or nuclear quantum effects in these simulations of large systems. So that's really the introduction motivating what I'm going to talk about, which are three different projects in my group that use supercomputers. They use either XSEED or Blue Waters. And they're actually very different applications. The first one is QMMM, so that's this hybrid method, free energy simulations. It could be used for enzymes or ribozymes. I'm going to talk about a ribozyme. That's an RNA enzyme. So that's a biological system where we need to include electronic quantum effects, but all of the nuclei can be pretty much classical. The second example I'll talk about is non-adiabatic molecular dynamic simulations of photo-induced proton-coupled electron transfer reactions. So you have an electron and a proton transferring. Now we do need to worry about the nuclear quantum effects of that proton. And this is very relevant to solar energy. So a lot of the energy-related uh, research in my group is, is really focused on this, this PCET. And then the third application is to electronic structure. Most people think if you're going to do electronic structure, all the nuclei are classical. We're just solving the electronic Schrodinger equation. But again, those hydrogen nuclei might be, have important quantum effects, and we've developed electronic structure methods that include the nuclear quantum effects of specific hydrogens, the one that are, ones that are important. And these are actually very computationally expensive, but they, that they could be very important for some of these applications up here. So I'll start by uh, talking about the first one, QMMM free energy simulations. This one's the most mature, so this is one where I actually have a, a story to tell um, where we really have worked very closely with experimentalists. The second one, we've also worked with experimentalists, but, but the story isn't quite done yet. And the third one, where really it's more methodological. So it will really go from sort of a longer story to a shorter and then to very brief story for that last one. So ribozymes are just RNA molecules that are capable of acting as enzymes. So they're catalysts. They can catalyze chemical reactions, just the same way a protein enzyme can. And they're biologically very important, a number of different, uh, different areas that I've listed here. And what we're particularly interested in is that they can self-cleave. They can catalyze the cleavage of themselves. So what you see down here is this oxygen is attacking this phosphorus. So you form an OP bond. And then you break this, this OP bond right here. So it's broken apart. So imagine a caterpillar moving along, right? And if it's able to somehow self-cleave itself, cut itself in half, and each half just happily goes off you know, wherever it wants to go. That's what's happening here. It's cutting itself in half and moving on. And that turns out to be biologically extremely important for the way our body works. Okay. So it's, it's understanding how it works actually has biomedical implications, which is why NIH is, is funding this work. So we want to understand a particular uh, ribozyme I'm going to talk about today, HDV. It's hepatitis delta virus. It's not that important what it is, but it self-cleaves itself, very similar to what I showed you before. This oxygen forms a bond with a phosphorus, and it breaks this bond. You can see it broke apart. And we work very closely with an experimental group to try to understand this. So they give us data. We try to explain it. And then we make predictions, and they test it. Um, this is Phil Bevilacqua at Penn State. That's where I used to be. So, but we've continued this collaboration while, while I'm here in Illinois, and it's, it's been a very fruitful collaboration. That, that's really the goal. If you're going to use, do all these com, you know, very, very complex and expensive computer simulations, it's very nice to be able to connect it to reality, right? That's really the theme in my group, all right? So, so what are the questions that we want to know? Well, one of the questions is these red arrows are showing different bonds that are breaking and forming, and one question is, is this happening in a concerted or sequential mechanism? Are they all happening at once? Or maybe this one goes first, and then this one, and then this one. That's a question that actually matters. And it can't be probed experimentally, so that's where theory really can play a role. And the other question is this magnesium here. It turns out that experimentally they know it's very important. 
If you don't have magnesium, it, it's, it's much slower. Things can change. Depending on the metal, things look different experimentally, but they don't know why. So we want to understand what's the role of that metal ion sitting right there. And again, that's where theory can actually play a role and help. So as I mentioned before, we're using QMMM calculations. So we, this is a huge system. We've got the entire ribozyme with solvated in water. So we've got hundreds of thousands of atoms. And what we do is we zoom in here on this active site, the part that I showed you already, and we treat only 87 atoms quantum mechanically, these red ones right here. And I won't go into the details of the methodology for those of you who, who know about it and care. There's lots of acronyms in electronic structure. It's uh, kind of overwhelming, but the bottom line is we're using QSight and Jaguar, which is part of the Schrodinger suite, to be able to do these kinds of QMMM calculations. And the first ones I'm going to talk about, all we're doing is we're saying, let's identify minima on the potential energy surface and saddle points that connect these minima. Those are called transition states. And that will tell us something about how this works. And then I'll, I'll go beyond that. We actually don't need supercomputers to do that. It's actually pretty fast. I'll go beyond that and say, how can we do better than that and include conformational sampling? And that's where we really have needed Exceed to allow us to do anything at all. So first we calculated the minima. These are the reactant and product minima. So you can see for the reactant, we have this bond formed. And for the product, this bond is formed. So we've broken and formed a bond. Actually, we've also broken and formed a bond down here. But what we have is we have a reactant and product minima. And then we said, all right, well, if we have the reactant and product, what about the transition state, the saddle point that connects them on the potential energy surface? And we were able to calculate that as well, and we were able to characterize it. What it is is it's called a phosphorane because this phosphorus is now bonded to five different things. That's unusual. So, and we also showed that it's a saddle point. So that tells us it's a concerted mechanism. It goes from reactant to product going over only one barrier. There's no intermediate. There's no stable intermediate. So it's actually concerted getting from here to here. And that's important information for the experimentalists. But what's really interesting is that we also tried putting a sodium here instead of a magnesium. So magnesium is what's naturally there in biological systems. But what happens if you put a sodium there? And what we found is then you get a different picture. Instead of being concerted, going over a single barrier, you actually get an intermediate. So it's a phosphorane intermediate. It actually looks very similar to our transition state. But now it's a sequential reaction. It goes over one barrier to get to this intermediate. And then in the second step, it goes over a second barrier to get to the product. So it's a very different mechanism. And the only thing we changed was putting a sodium instead of a magnesium. So then we went through and we said, well, all right, let's try other divalent and monovalent uh, ions. And so you can see whenever it's divalent for magnesium and calcium, it's actually concerted. We see a transition state as a phosphorane. And when it's a monovalent, sodium, lithium, potassium, cesium, we see that it's actually got an intermediate, a phosphorane intermediate. So it's sequential. So this is something they wouldn't have been able to guess experimentally. So theory is, in fact, driving experiment here. So we've shown that depending on the identity or the charge of that, uh, that ion there, you can change the mechanism. And if we want to understand why, we can take those structures of the transition state in the intermediate and overlay them. And we see that the, they look actually very similar. The difference here is this proton. This proton is actually moving just a little bit more for the transition state. And so when we went through a lot of the different types of calculations, we were able to show that that when you have a divalent metal ion here, it pulls electronic density and makes it easier for that proton to leave. It's more acidic. So we were able to actually explain not only this, is, this exists, but explain why, just by doing fairly simple calculations that don't include, don't involve, or require supercomputers at all. all right? but, but it's a little unsatisfying, because the potential energy surface for this kind of a system is, it looks something, well, this is very schematic, but it's got lots of minima and lots of transition states. So how do we know that we're in the right one? Right? How do we know that, uh, that we didn't choose some sort of wrong one and we're in the wrong region of phase space? And the other thing is, if we want to calculate a rate constant to compare to experiment, we need free energy barriers, not potential energies. Because we need to include entropic contributions. The entropy of these large systems is very important. So we really need a free energy, not a potential energy surface, to compare to experiment. And if it's a free energy surface, remember at the beginning I told you you have a low probability of sampling high free energy regions, say up here on this ridge. Well, how are we going to sample those regions with molecular dynamics? If you did classical molecular dynamics on the system, you'd stay down here. It's nice and happy in that minimum. Why, you know, why would it ever go up there if that's much higher than the thermal energy? It simply won't go there at all. So we have a lot of challenges here. 
But we can, and our goal really it, to look at these kinds of systems is to generate multidimensional free energy surfaces without assuming a reaction path and including conformational sampling of the whole thing, or the important parts at least, in a practical way. So what we do is we combine something called umbrella sampling molecular dynamics with a finite temperature string method. This is just, these are just words. I'll show you what it means in order to allow us to do this. So the string method, which we did not invent, these people down here actually invented, we just adapted it for our purposes. The string method is actually very straightforward. What you do in general is you consider a set of M reaction coordinates by which the reaction can be described. So in this case, it's R1 and R2. M is 2. And then you choose an initial string that goes from the reactants to the products in this M dimensional space, so in this two dimensional space. So you come up, start out with an initial guess. And this is our string. Then we divide the string into n images. So you've got four of them here, four images. And then you do molecular dynamics on each of these images with restraining potentials on these m reaction coordinates, so these two reaction coordinates. And that's, you need to restrain them or they'll all fall down into the lowest minimum. They'll get stuck and you'll, basically it'll be a waste of time. We need to keep it so that it's actually looking at the chemical reaction we are interested in. So we need to restrain it. So we restrain it and then we do MD. Okay, so you can't really see that very well in this projector, but basically we're doing MD and we've got some sort of sampling different regions here. And then what we do is we say, all right, let's calculate the average from our restrained dynamics and let's move our string. So we now find a new string that connects these new averages. We do new restraints, we do MD, and we keep doing iterations like this over and over again until the whole thing is converged and you have your final string that's not changing anymore. And then what you do is you say, okay, I've got all this information with restrained dynamics, but I really want to know the free energy for the real system. So there are statistical methods that allow you to unbias your data and get the free energy curve for the real system. And that's our goal. And that's called a minimum free energy path. And the key features are, of this uh, method are that it scales linearly with the number of images. So we can send each one of these images to a different processor. They don't even talk to each other. They, it doesn't matter. So it's actually very embarrassingly parallelizable, very easy to parallelize. It doesn't depend on the number of reaction coordinates, making this 5, 10, 12, whatever. It doesn't really matter. And the inclusion of, of this a whole bunch of reaction coordinates will obviate the need for knowing the reaction path ahead of time. We don't want to have a priori knowledge of the reaction path. We don't want to bias it in that way. And this gives us information about the mechanism and the free energy barriers. So what we did is we took this method and applied it to the ribozyme system that I was talking about before. These are some of the computational details. Again, I'm not going to belabor them. We used a com a, an interface between QChem and CHARM to do this. We have 12 reaction coordinates. There's really only four important ones, but we included more because uh, better to include too many than not enough, and the computational expense doesn't, uh, doesn't increase. And then we basically used Exceed to, to generate a lot of data. So what we did is we had to install the QChem Charm interface on Exceed. That took a little bit of time to get it running properly. And then we have like 20 to 30 images run as independent trajectories. So each one would be run on a 16 CPU cores on one node. In this case, the computational bottleneck is the QM calculation, which depends on the QM region size. We have 87 atoms. We typically have about that many. So the, the scaling depends on the QM calculation, which is done in QChem. And it's, the scaling factor is about 7 for 8 processors and about 12 for 16. So that's why we run on 16. We, we, get, we get at least you know, quite a bit of speed up. And then we run one iteration, for, takes about 20 hours. And we need about 25 iterations. And we have 30 images. You can do the multiplication. It takes a fair amount of computer time to generate the entire string. But we found that it actually provides a lot of information for us. So what did we learn then when we did these, these, these calculations? Well, here's a, we, project, we actually did 12-dimensional free energy surfaces, but this is projected into two-dimensional space. The dashed string is our initial guess. The solid one here is the final converged string. You can see that it moved, right? Our initial guess wasn't so good, but that's okay. The method fixes itself. And we found that it's indeed a concerted mechanism, consistent with what we saw before, but we got more details and more information by doing conformational sampling. For example, it's an exergonic reaction, and we found that it's actually more synchronous than we had thought before. So we can actually get a free energy barrier now of 13 kcals per mole. We can compare to experiment, and if you take their rate constant and convert it to free energy barriers, you get 11 to 14. That's actually really good. The statistical error on our barrier is about 1 kcal per mole, but there's also systematic error. 
So, um, so putting all that together, that's a level of agreement we really, we're really happy with. And if you look at this, these, these curves here, these are distances as a function along the reaction path. This is information you cannot get experimentally. So really the goal here and a lot of what we do in my, in my group is we calculate experimental observables we can compare to experiment to be sure that we are on the right track, to be sure we're not off in Never Never Land, right? We need to stay grounded with experiment. But then we, we don't want to just reproduce experiment. That's not really very interesting. Why, you know, why would you do that? But we want to learn more so we can learn information on the atomic level about what's going on that they can't get. They're just not accessible experimentally. And that's what we did here. We really could see exactly what happens first. Turns out this happens first and then this. And all that, even though it's a concerted reaction, there's still different things are happening at different times along the concerted reaction pathway. And we get all that information. And the other question that comes up is how sensitive is this method to your initial guess, your initial string? Okay, so what we did to, you know, this came up with reviewers, but it, even before the reviewers asked, we had asked ourselves this, right? You want to know the answer to that. And so what we did is we, we started three different strings with three different guesses. So there's a concerted one, A, and then there's a sequential mechanism where you first transfer the proton and then do the rest of it. And then there's the concerted mechanism where you first attack the uh, phosphorus and then do the rest of it. So we started with three very different strings shown by these dashed lines here, A, B, and C. B, you can see, is way different. And as we ran the simulation, they all came to the same place. The solid lines are the converged strings. Purple's not fully converged because, well, we ran out of exceed time, but it also wasn't really a very useful exercise. We saw it was heading that way. So we were pretty convinced that it went all the way from here to here. It's basically going to the same place. So this tells us that the method's not all that sensitive to the initial guess, which is very important because you don't want to have to, you don't want to bias it in that way. So that's really a technical issue, but it's an important one to be able to believe the results. So then we said, let's redo everything with sodium instead of magnesium because our previous calculations showed that there's a difference. And indeed, we found even when we calculate free energies, including all that conformational sampling, we also get a sequential mechanism again for sodium, whereas it was concerted for magnesium. And we got all sorts of, again, atomic level information about what's going on with sodium. Here's the uh, sequential, that's the minimum, that's the intermediate right there. You go over one, so that's step one, and then you have step two. So it's sequential, it looks very different from what I showed you for magnesium. And we found that, uh, we, we told our experimental collaborators this is what we're finding, and they were able to do what are called proton inventory experiments, and they saw that indeed magnesium is concerted and sodium is, con I mean, and, and sodium is sequential. So they confirmed our experimental prediction. We also were able to calculate a rate here and compare it to experiment, and it looks like it should be much faster, because it's basically three kcals per mole instead of 13. But it turns out that there's actually a, st a step before this to activate the system. You have to basically deprotonate that oxygen, and that turns out to be harder with sodium than with magnesium. So after some involved uh, calculations and discussions, we were able to show that the rates are consistent with experiment as well. One other piece that came out of the theory that they never would have guessed experimentally is we saw that for this intermediate, there's actually a proton transfer from this nitrogen to this oxygen. And, you know, we see this in our simulations and they, you know, you, there's always some skepticism. Well, are you really, is that real or not? So what they were able to do experimentally is change that oxygen to a sulfur, which wouldn't accept the proton. And they did indeed see that that really slows down the reaction. So they found that we made a prediction and they were able to test it by modifying this oxygen to a sulfur. And this is the feedback that we have between experiment and theory in these kinds of projects. So just to recap what we learned from these QMMM free energy simulations, we have a methodology that allows bonds to break and form. It allows conformational sampling, so we can sample those high free energy, low probability regions. We can calculate rate constants and show that they're consistent with experimental data. Our simulations showed that uh, magnesium and sodium at the active site give different mechanisms and we could predict, make predictions that could be tested then experimentally using different metal ions there, sulfur substitution and all sorts of different experiments that I'm skipping over for this, this particular audience, more interested in the computation than the experiments. But it's, it's very, um, to me, very satisfying to be able to work with the experimentalists and, and generate results that, that they care about as well.
So that's the story with the QMMM free energy simulations of a ribozyme. Now I'm going to change tracks, and I'm going to talk about uh, non-adiabatic molecular dynamic simulations of photoinduced proton-coupled electron transfer. So now we have both an electron and a proton transferring. So before we cared about bonds breaking and forming, so electrons, but we didn't care about the protons. Now we have to worry about nuclear quantum effects as well as electronic quantum effects in, in this, this type of an application. So, so life gets a little more complicated here. So proton coupled electron transfer is actually important throughout biology and photosynthesis, respiration, many enzymes, and also in chemical processes that are relative, relevant to solar cells. So these are two examples, photosynthesis and solar cells. You see electrons and protons going all different directions in both cases. And that's all PCET. So this is an example of, of, of kind of being lucky enough to, to start in a field before everybody realizes it's important. So I started this way back when I was an assistant professor at Notre Dame, so back in the late 90s, really. And uh, nobody really thought about PCET then. Okay? So we came up with a theory, and we, we spent you know, basically uh, um, a decade or more developing a theory for PCET that's now actually used by the experimentalists. And now there's a lot of interest in PCET with all the money going toward alternative energy conversion devices. Everybody realizes it's all PCET underlying these solar cells and if you want to do artificial photosynthesis and all of that. So it's all a very exciting field. Now there are entire conferences on PCET, whereas when I started, right, there were, there were only a few papers on it. So, so this has been really fun to see the evolution of this field. And what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to skip over all of the theory part, but I'm going to focus very much on Photoinduced PCET, because we know that photosynthesis requires light, right? Your plant will die if you put it in the dark, okay? So solar cells, obviously, by definition, right, they require sunlight. That's how they work. That's where the energy is coming from. So understanding how these systems work when you shine light on them, when you basically excite the electrons to excited electronic states, that's very important for designing better solar cells. But we have a number of challenges now that didn't exist before in the previous project when we want to simulate photoinduced PCET. We still have the bonds breaking and forming. We can use a QMMM method. We've, we've got that down. But it's more complicated now because we have excited electronic states. Before, everything was on the ground state for enzymes, usually, you know, for, um, for, certainly for the ribozyme. But when we're photoexciting something, by definition, you're starting in an excited electronic state. It's much harder to calculate those. You can't use density functional theory. You have to use multi-configurational methods to really get it right. And also, the system doesn't stay in a single electronic state. The whole point is you photoexcite it up here, and it trickles down to the ground states. All right? So you need to be able to use what's called a non-adiabatic dynamics method to watch it trickle down from the excited state to the ground state. And also now we have a transferring proton that behaves quantum mechanically. The fact that it's all photoexcited means the nuclear quantum effects, the zero point energy and the hydrogen tunneling of that proton, all that's important too. So our objective in this project is to develop methodology that, we, that allows us to calculate excited electronic states on the fly during the molecular dynamic simulation in a practical manner. We also need to describe the relaxation from the excited electronic states to the ground state after you've photoexcited it up there. And we also need to treat this transferring hydrogen nucleus quantum mechanically. So it looks like a tall order, but we had a lot of the pieces, actually, from other projects in my group before we started this. We actually started this only, only a few years ago. But it turns out that we were studying enzymes for, for a long time, and we looked at hydrogen tunneling in an enzyme. And this is, this is a, a movie of hydrogen tunneling in an enzyme. What we do here is we treat the, the hydrogen as a three-dimensional nuclear wave function. And we can actually, at every molecular dynamics time step, we calculate that wave function. It depends on the environment, and the environment is affected by the wave function. So there's this feedback between the proton wave function and the environment. And you can actually see hydrogen tunneling in this particular enzyme, dihydrofolate reductase. So it starts out on one side of that double well potential, and you'll see it smear out. It becomes like the shape of a peanut right there. That's where it tunneled. You see that it delocalized between your two wells in that double well potential. So remember that double well potential I showed before. That's all this is doing. It's starting on one side. It smears out because it's got some probability of going through the barrier region. And it ends up on the other side. And we have the technology. We've developed the methodology to be able to study these kinds of hydrogen tunneling reactions. So all we need to do is use these methods in our photoinduced PCET. What about non-adiabatic molecular dynamics? Well, it turns out a lot of that methodology we also had for other other purposes. 
So what we want to do is we want to photo excite to an excited state and look at the real time non equilibrium dynamics of the solute and the solvent of everything as it moves down from the excited state all the way trickling down to the ground state. And we also want to be treating that proton quantum mechanically. So John Tully back in 1990 developed a method for doing this with electronic states, pure electronic states. He included instantaneous transitions between electronic states. So he integrated the time dependent Schrodinger equation, figured out when these transitions should occur. You run lots of trajectories and then you, they move classically on a single curve. So this is moving classically and then there's a quick non adiabatic transition and it starts moving classically again on this surface. And that allows you to describe these kinds of relaxation processes on electronic states. So what we did in this work up here is we extended this so now you're not moving on electronic states but you're moving on mixed electron proton vibronic states because the proton is quantum as well. So you've got lots of them like this and you start up here and you're going to basically be using John Tully's algorithm to switch. So you basically trickle down, you go like this, you go like this and you'll fall down and each trajectory will follow a different pathway and then you average over all of your trajectories to figure out how the actual system is going to decay from the excited state all the way down to the ground state. And here are some examples. These are, these are trajectories, there's like 10,000 of them. You photo excite it and you see them trickling down. This is the time, It'll, it actually wraps around this movie. And this just shows you that basically we, can, we have the methodology to do this. This was for a very simple model system. And now the goal is can we apply it to a real system? So we could do these calculations on our own cluster. We didn't need a supercomputer. It was, it was actually, these are small systems. They're easy, no problem. But if we're going to look at a real molecule and solution, then, we, then we, that's where we really need blue waters. So this is the molecule that we want to look at. So this was actually studied experimentally. As I said, we're always motivated by the experimentalists. And what you have is you have an electron transferring up over this way, and a proton is actually transferring from this oxygen to this nitrogen. This is a, a, a mean base that's hydrogen bonded here. And like I said, they've, they've actually got experiments. And what's really interesting about the experiments is they see two different mechanisms. This is uh, from Tom Meyer's group at UNC in this PNAS uh, 2011 paper. So they basically can photo excite to two different states. If they photo excite up here to this, this red one, the ICT, intramolecular charge transfer, First they have electron transfer, then a little bit of relaxation, and then proton transfer. That's one pathway. The second one is what they call EPT, for electron-proton transfer. They photo excite in this blue one, and the electron and proton transfer together upon photo excitation. That's the first time this had been seen in, in, in Tom Meyer's uh, um, PNAS paper. So this is a very interesting phenomenon to transfer both electron proton upon photo excitation. And again, that's very relevant to solar cells and to photosynthesis. These sorts of things are happening in those. But this is a much simpler system than those messy systems I showed you before. We have to, we have to understand this before we can understand photosynthesis. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to simulate this reaction. And to do this, we had to use all that methodology I've been talking about. So we want to look, we want to photo excite and then look at the real time non equilibrium dynamics of the solute and the solvent after this photo excite excitation. So we need to generate these electronic states on the fly and we do this with a semi-empirical, this again an acronym from the electronic structure people, FOMO CASCI. It's a very expensive multi-configurational method that's made less expensive by the semi-empirical aspect where you approximate the integrals by semi-empirical functional form. So that's the only way we're able to really do this on the fly. We use a QMMM method, so only the molecule is treated with this, this method here. And the rest of the system, all of these solvent molecules, those are just molecular mechanical force fields like I described before. We have the extra complication of this proton is moving, uh, got to be treated quantum mechanically. We treat it in one dimension. I showed you that movie of the enzyme, that was 3D. This is just 1D, it's much easier, 3D would not be possible. So basically, if we, we treat this proton in a one dimension with those grid-based methods that we use for the enzyme. And then we use surface hopping, that method I showed you about non adiabatic dynamics, to allow us to move between the electron-proton vibronic surfaces. So we have all of the technology, we just need to put it all together. And that's what we've, we've done. This is actually our initial step, which we could do on our uh, cluster, because the proton is classical. When the proton's classical, life is easy. So we don't have that whole grid to worry about. So we just photo excite to these excited electronic states. We're generating them on the fly. We can do uh, thousands of trajectories or at least hundreds and see what happens. So we excite to the S1 and the S2 excited states. The blue is S1, the red is S2 here. We photo excited S1. And you can see it decays in about three picoseconds. Here we uh, photo excited to S2, the red one. It's a blow up right here. It, it decays in about 100 femtoseconds and then 
it's on the S1 state and it decays on the slower time scale. The important part here is that this agrees with experiment. Again, we always have to compare to experiment to make sure we're on the right track. Otherwise, how do we know we're doing anything right? In this case, the relaxation times matched Tom Meyer's experiment, qualitatively at least. We knew we were in the right ballpark. But what's interesting is that experimentally, they called that state EPT for electron-proton transfer, but they didn't actually see the proton transfer. They didn't have the experimental methods to be able to do that. There's no experimental technique that will look at that proton transfer on that time scale. But in our, our calculations, we could see it. And so we looked for it. We said, okay, what happens in this, this blue state here? Does the proton actually transfer? That was their hypothesis, but they never actually proved it. And so we did indeed see this proton transfer. This is the OH and the NH distance. And so basically when this NH distance gets smaller, right here, that proton transferred from the oxygen to the nitrogen. This is just one particular trajectory from our hundreds, but we saw about 50, 60 percent actually did do proton transfer. So that's some information that they didn't have experimentally. And that's important information because it matters if you're going to be designing solar cells with these kinds of molecules. So again, an example where we compare to experiment, get agreement, and then give them some atomic level information they did not have before. Now, that's all classical proton. Like I said, we could run it on our, uh, our own cluster. But we really want to treat that proton quantum mechanically to see if it's important. And for that, that's where we need blue waters. Because what we have to do is we treat the proton on a grid connecting the nitrogen and the oxygen. This is the hydrogen coordinate. So for each of these grid points, we have to calculate the energies, the forces, and the non-adiabatic couplings. And that's expensive. Because if we have, say, 24 grid points, we have to do this 24 times for every molecular dynamics time step. Okay, so it gets, it gets very quickly um, impossible to do, certainly on our cluster. So the, the, um, what we do is we basically calculate each one of these on an independent processor, and then we need to combine them. So you need all of these points at each time step to calculate the proton wave function to solve the Schrodinger equation for moving here. And then we can calculate the electron-proton vibronic states and do non-adiabatic molecular dynamics. But we need to do all of this first, and that's the costly part, is getting these surfaces at each molecular dynamics time step. And that's where Blue Waters comes in. We took our code. We've now installed it on Blue Waters. It's running. We are actually, some of these, these this is in progress. I think some of these are running as we, as we speak. All right, so, so basically what we do is we have 24 grid points that we run independently. The computational bottleneck is the calculation of forces and couplings for each one of these points. So we take each grid point and we run it on a single processor. It's all in a single node. So we use the distributed data MPI strategy for parallelization. The scaling factor is about 10 for 24 processors, so it's not perfect. And that's because we have a communication in passing large arrays. Because we can do them each independently, but we need to gather them all up at every MD time step and combine them to calculate this, these wave functions. So it's not completely independently. They still have to talk to each other. And that, that hurts a little bit in terms of our speed up and parallelization. So each trajectory, which is only three picoseconds or so, takes 16 days, all right? And, it, and we have to run, it, we'd like to run thousands, but that's not practical. So we want to run 50 to 100 trajectories. This is expensive. So basically, this will use up about half of my Blue Waters allocation to, to run these kinds of simulations. But it's the first time this has been done. It, there's been lots of, of, of these kinds of calculations with classical protons. But with a quantum proton in this way, for these kinds of processes, this, this, this was not really possible before now. So this will be the first instance where we're able to really see how does the nuclear quantum effect to the proton, how, did that, how does that affect the relaxation times, the isotope effects, the, all sorts of different, different properties we can look at. So to recap what we're doing here with this photo-induced PCET, we have a methodology that allows us to, to simulate excited electronic surfaces and treat the transferring hydrogen nucleus quantum mechanically. We generate the potential energy surface on the fly. We calculate the proton wave function on a grid. And then we can calculate relaxation times and show that they're consistent with the experimental data. And we also can learn more than they can get experimentally about the solute solvent dynamics, vibrational relaxation, proton delocalization, and the list goes on and on. Once we have the data, we can then spend a lot of time analyzing it and see what we can learn from it. So now we get to the last of our types of hybrid quantum classical. And this is going to be the briefest story because it's still very much uh, a work in progress. You can see that this one was pretty much done. This is almost done, and this one's not done. So on this one, we also had to use blue waters for. And here what we're trying to do is we're trying to do electronic structure calculations. Instead of using the grid-based methods, we want to use molecular orbital methods 
and treat certain hydrogen nuclei quantum mechanically on the same level as the electrons with the electronic structure methods. And so we know that for molecules, nuclear quantum effects are important in many ways. Zero point energy, already talked about, vibrationally excited states, and hydrogen bonding involves nuclear quantum effects. Hydrogen tunneling is something like the molecule malonaldehyde. So the list, list goes on and on. So to do this, we've developed a method we call NEO, N-E-O for nuclear electronic orbital method, where we solve a mixed nuclear electronic time independent Schrodinger equation with molecular orbital methods. So the idea is we don't want to treat all of the nuclei quantum mechanically, just the important ones, the key ones. For example, in malonaldehyde, this hydrogen that happens to be transferring, we treat that one quantum mechanically, but everything else is just classical. And this avoids the Born-Oppenheimer separation between the electrons and these select quantum nuclei. So basically, you don't have to separate them because the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, in fact, breaks down. You can't s separate them rigorously. And this will give us those electronic vibron proton vibronic states I was talking about in the previous project, but in a very different way. It'll, it'll be, we get them all at once instead of having to do everything on a grid, which you saw was very costly in terms of, of the amount of computer time we needed to use. So there are many challenges that come up in this, this, this project, and I don't have time to go into all of the deep theoretical issues. But the real problem is that the electronic structure people have been dealing with electron-electron dynamical correlation for decades, right? There are many methods out there. I'm sure you've seen these Gaussian codes and whatever else, electronic structure codes churning away on the supercomputers. And electron-electron dynamical correlation is often icing on the cake. So it's quantitatively important, but it's usually not the main, the main picture. And that's because electrons repel each other. So they don't spend a lot of time near each other where these complicated correlation effects are important. Now, electron-proton correlation is the cake itself because electrons and protons attract each other. So that means that they're spending a lot of time in the region where these effects are important. So a lot of the methodology developed over the past few decades, you know, starting with Popol, right, they're, they're useless to us. They don't work for attractive interactions. They're all designed for repulsive interactions. So we've had to develop a bunch of new, new methodology. We need to use explicitly correlated methods with ge geminal Gaussian functions to, um, to, to with something we call NEO-XCHF. So we have our own acronyms. I'm probably as worse, you know, worse than some of the uh, other electronic structure people. But you've got to have an acronym. You've got to call it something. And um, we've, we've had to develop algorithms to make it faster, more computationally tractable. And it's still, though, very expensive. And it requires the calculation and storage of a large number of many particle integrals. So that's what's killing us here. And that's where Blue Waters has really saved us. We wouldn't have been able to do any of this without, without Blue Waters. So we did test the method for positrons. And positron is just a, 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 has the mass of an electron and the charge of a proton. So there's a whole community that, that cares about that. We actually were just using it for um, benchmarking our code. And, uh, so, but there are many applications. And the, 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 the take home message is that we show that the code and the method works very well. We've got good agreement with, with very high level um, computationally expensive methods. Now we want to do proton containing systems where things get much more complicated. These two molecules, HCN and FHF minus, they were run on blue waters. We wouldn't have been able to do this otherwise. These are actually very expensive. They look like small molecules, but, but nobody's ever actually done this before with these explicitly correlated methods. With, it, with this hydrogen nucleus here and here was treated quantum mechanically with the electrons, with all of this explicit correlation. The benchmark is this black curve. This is a proton density. Our best method is the green one. And you can see we get pretty good, pretty good agreement. So in order to do this, we needed to use Blue Waters. So we installed our in-house NEO code there. And this is actually the first thing we did on Blue Waters. We, in fact, used our entire allocation from last year on these two molecules. So we had uh, more than one terabyte of, of integrals that had to be calculated and stored. So we used hybrid MPI and OpenMP to parallelize all this so we actually could run on 4,096 nodes. So here we're really taking advantage. So these are not embarrassingly parallelizable anymore, right? We're, we're actually taking advantage of, of, of Blue Waters and the architecture. And so we, we could run, run all these integrals and store them. And then the SCF part, that part is actually very quick. That's not the problem. So we were able to do this and show that it agrees with, with benchmarks. But we need to speed it up, right? We can't, we can't live with this, this, this expense. We want to do bigger molecules. And we don't want to have to, to, to use, you know, wait a year every time we want to do one. And that's actually in progress. They're actually much faster. We've got, we think we have two or three orders of magnitude with the speed up of integrals. I've hired someone to do this. So that's going to save us. But we really needed these initial ones to show the method worked, to show that it was worth hiring someone to speed up the integrals. So that's why the blue waters allocation was important, because you don't want to have someone waste a year of their life speeding up integrals that, for a method that's not going to work. So that was actually very important to do those sort of the, 
the brute force ones first, but eventually, obviously, we, we, we can't live with that, that uh, expense, but we're on our way, and so we basically eventually want to look at PCET systems, which is where these nuclear quantum effects are important, and uh, we have uh, applications relevant to energy conversion. So to summarize, I've told you about three very different types of applications. The first one was run on Xseed, the second and third were run on Blue Waters, and in all cases, they wouldn't have been possible without that on our own cluster. You can see that we did all our preliminary stuff on our own cluster, and then the production, we, when we had to really do it right, we had to use a supercomputer. And current directions, all these are, are continuing. We're continuing to develop the methods, to develop the algorithms, to make it faster so that we can ask different questions, more complicated questions, look at larger systems, and continue to work with the experimentalists to help explain their data and help predict maybe design better catalysts, that's another part of my group as well. So these are some of the people that did the work. Um, uh, the, the ribozyme work was done mostly by Abir Ganguly, and the photo-induced PCET was done by Alexander Sudikov and Christine and Pooja, and the uh, NEO method uh, uh, calculations were done by Andrew Serjusing, Mike Pack, and Kurt Borson. Kurt's still here, he's, he's still working um, on Blue Waters directly. The funding was NIH funds the biological part of my group. Air Force and NSF fund both the photo-induced PCET and NEO. Right now, Air Force is funding photo-induced. NSF is funding NEO. And then these are the centers I mentioned we're designing molecular electrocatalysts for solar energy. These centers are, are where we're working. We don't need supercomputers for that, so we can just run them on our clusters. They're, they're more standard calculations. So my group really spans the applied and the method development, and so we use the supercomputers when we need them. And so we're very grateful to Exceed and Blue Waters for allowing us to run all of these calculations. So thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions. There are a couple of questions for Sharon. Vlad. Thank you. So actually, I, I do have a couple of questions. So one of them is for uh, um, uh, integrals calculation. Do, do, have you considered using um, um, accelerators of some sort, GPUs or? For which ones? For electronic, uh, for, uh, for integral calculation. For the integrals. Yeah. Uh, you mean in the NEO project? Yeah, in the NEO project. We have not used, been using GPUs. I'm not, I don't think GPUs are going to give us a huge savings yes, there, but I am working on those integrals with Todd Martinez at Stanford, who oh, is, sure. he's very okay, into sure. the GPUs, right, so right, right. that is where eventually we're going to go with the integrals. But first we need them working on CPUs. Sure. We're already going to get a sort of, a, we really see already about a three order of magnitude speed up with the CPUs. Now GPUs actually are very useful for some of the, the classical MD. Uh, Amber GPU is mm -hmm. giving us an order of magnitude faster um, than, uh, than the CPU version of Amber. So we do use GPUs, but not for the electronic structure part of our group yet. But yes, it could be, it could be a savings, but there's enough algorithmic things we can do even on CPUs before we get to that point where we need GPUs. See, the other thing is, so you, there are systems which have a lot of memory, so you potentially can store those one terabyte in memory. Uh, have you thought about that? We do store it. Oh, you do store yes, it? Yes, we do store it because then we can use the integrals later and do different types of yeah, calculations. But do you store it in memory or on disk? Disk. Okay. Right now. We can do both. We have capability to do both. But if we can store it in disk, that means we can retrieve them and do other, you know, we, we basically, if we spend all that effort doing them, we like to have them so in case, say, something was wrong or we weren't fully converged with our SCF procedure, we want to have the capability to try different initial guesses and things like that. So we, mm -hmm. we've been storing them so far. Uh, but uh, the good news is I didn't get into any details of that project, but for even for larger systems, the storage won't get worse than that. That's because what happens is we, we're only going to explicitly correlate the electrons near the protons so that those systems, if, if you view a larger system, we'll just have that, that part of the larger system will be treated at the same level and the rest of the system will be treated with standard electronic structure methods. So that's, that's actually the big uh, sort of paradigm shift that we had to, had to go through to realize that we could do the, the bigger systems that we wanted, which is, so in some sense, it's not like you might think this is going to scale terribly for bigger systems, but mm -hmm. the scaling, that's kind of, that's the cap. So it won't get worse. If we can do that, we're, we're good to go. We can, we can do that. And eventually we could do them on the fly and store them in memory. You're absolutely right. Direct SCF is a possibility, yeah. Okay, so last question is this. Uh, so uh, this methods run at different time, uh, time steps, right? So classical methods would, would be at femtoseconds or something, and then this uh, uh, quantum effects methods are, have to run much faster. How do you link these things together? 
So with the QMMM method yeah. you're talking about, so for the, for the biological simulations, right, for, if you're just doing QMMM and you're using QM to get the potential energy surface, you can still use the femtosecond or time step because the quantum part is really just to, to get the potential energy surface that allows bonds to break and form. Now, you might be talking about when the nucleus, when the proton nucleus is treated quantum mechanically, then you need a smaller time step or a non-adiabatic dynamic. So there we use multiple time step algorithms where the classical part is treated on the one femtosecond time step, and then the time, the time dependent Schrodinger equation that we have to in, integrate for each time, uh, for each classical step, we would have, say, 100 or 1,000 uh, smaller time steps for the quantum part. So that way, and since the expense is actually in the classical part for those sorts of calculations, for getting the potential, the forces and the non adiabatic couplings, that's the expense. So the time independent one, we can actually do interpolations of forces and couplings that allow us to to not actually increase the, the, the expense much by using smaller time steps for the time dependent Schrodinger equation within each classical time step. So it turns out that actually doing a thousand uh, quantum steps within each classical doesn't, doesn't change anything. It's like a 5% you know, increase in cost. It's really minimal. It's not a problem. So, Victor? Yeah, um, much, much lower level kind of question. Um, in the mixed methods that you showed in the first part of your talk, it seems that these methods would be extremely applicable in doing and optimizing enzyme designs. Have you done any work that goes in that direction, or are you planning to do that? Which I kind mean, of designs? I'm sorry, I didn't. Uh, to, to design to enzymes that have optimal uh, uh, so for enzyme, reaction like protein rates. design. Yeah, yes, yeah, I yeah. have been involved in in some efforts along those lines. Right, so. So I've, I've been in groups, and there, there are certainly people around the country, David Baker, Steve Mayo, that, that are working on, on using these kinds of methods for protein design. Um, a lot of what they, are, they do is they try to get really accurate electronic structure calculations, really accurate transition states in the gas phase, and they try to build the enzyme around it. And I actually think that that's not a good strategy. So I've been, because I actually think this conformational sampling is very important. So you get everything perfect in the gas phase, right? And then you add everything else, like the spaghetti, what they call it. Well, the spaghetti is not just spaghetti, unfortunately. The spaghetti, you add it and you get every, you know, everything you got perfect suddenly goes away because differences of, say, a tenth of an angstrom for catalysis, for, for uh, chemistry, matter. And so the conformational sampling of the environment would matter. So in, in our efforts along those lines, we have to include the whole system. Of course, that makes it harder to do really fast screening. But I think the problem is if you only include the active site or even smaller, you really you can miss the whole point of the protein design. So the protein design is not just structural, it actually also includes conformational issues. And that's actually been a very important concept, and I think it's now being embraced. And this is something that we were saying in the early 2000s. And I think now, you know, it, is, it, it just makes life much more complicated. So of course people don't want it to be um, the case, but, but I think that it, is, it does make, make things more complicated, but it's necessary. And so I personally am not involved right now in, 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 in protein design and, and engineering, but I think uh, some of the concepts that come out of our work can then be applied by others. It's a, it becomes a little bit more of an engineering problem, and, uh, but it's a very important problem, and it's been tough. I'd say that there's been not so much success so far, and part of it is maybe they were thinking too much about structure and not enough about how things are moving as well, because things, these chemical reactions are not going to happen unless things move, because you've got to move and get everything in place for the chemistry to happen. And so, um, so in taking that into account, I think maybe there will be more success in the future. But yeah, many of these concepts are directly applicable to protein design. So we have some light refreshments outside, so I'd like to suggest we uh, thank Sharon again and move discussions and questions outside. <laughs>